Hello, my name is Cecilia Padron. I am one of the assistant medical directors and EMS fellows with Orange County EMS. I will be presenting an introduction to the alternative destination protocol. So our objectives today are to go over a background and introduction to the Recovery Response Center. Um, we'll review the new protocols. Uh, we'll go over a couple of case scenarios and briefly discuss available resources and then discuss the logistics for transport. So why are we talking about this? Uh, this was an article recently published in August of 2022, specifically looking at uh, the unsustainable burden on North Carolina hospital systems in regard to behavior, behavioral health emergencies, and behavioral health disorders um, at our local tertiary care center at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, we have seen an increase in the psychiatry clinic visits of 150%. Uh, many of us have seen the wait times for mental health care consistently increase over the past year. Um, and ultimately, these patients are probably not receiving the best care. So recently, we um, created an agreement with the Recovery Response Center to receive some of our patients from Orange County um, who meet the in inclusion criteria and uh, do not fall out based on exclusion criteria. Um, the Recovery Response Center is a, a, a team that has multiple facilities around the country. Um, specifically, this one in Durham County is able to facilitate 24-7 coverage of behavioral health emergencies, including patients who are under an IVC. Um, they're evaluated by a psychiatrist or a psychiatry nurse practitioner, um, and they cover both detox and behavioral health emergencies. So we currently have a few protocols related to uh, uh, intoxication, inebriated persons, um, behavioral health emergencies, uh, and uh, um, mental health disorders, including um, UP17 through 21, um, the behavioral health crisis, behavioral agitation sedation guide, the behavioral excited delirium syndrome, which will uh, um, at some point be named uh, the hyperactive delirium with agitation, and our inebriated persons protocol, and our mobile crisis mental health medical clearance protocol. So the first step is to make sure that this patient does not fall into another protocol. Um, if the patient falls into another protocol, please follow through with those protocols before proceeding to this new protocol. Um, after that, we're, basic, we're asking a few basic questions. We're asking, does the patient require resuscitation? Uh, does the patient have an organic etiology to their presentation? Uh, does the patient have a medical condition that requires additional medical care? And is the patient able to receive mental health care independently with minimal nursing care? And so as you see, uh, the first step is, does this patient have any medical or traumatic conditions that would preclude them from uh, transfer to an alternative destination? And does the patient have any abnormal vital signs in regard to a fever, uh, heart rate gr greater than 120 or less than 50, um, an increased respiratory rate, um, either excessively hypertensive with BP of 200 over 100, um, or a systolic blood pressure uh, less than 100, which would be suspicious for hypotension, and uh, any patient that has either symptomatic or asymptomatic um, hypo or hyperglycemia defined as a blood glucose less than 60 or greater than 400. <clears throat> the next step in the protocol is, does this patient have uh, altered mental status or has had a seizure in the past 72 hours? Um, patients with altered mental status should be suspected to have an organic etiology to um, their disease process. And um, these patients also do not meet medical decision-making capacity, which is required to um, elect to go to an alternative destination. Next in the protocol is uh, assessing for any uh, medical devices that would require frequent monitoring. Um, and this includes patients who are on oxygen or CPAP, any patient with a PIC line, a PEG tube, uh, or a left ventricular assist device, um, any patients who require dialysis three times a week or require peritoneal or hemodialysis, um, any patient that has that needs primary wound closure uh, or significant wound care, um, and any patient who is pregnant greater than um, 28 weeks gestation or third trimester pregnancy. 
after that, um, we have to determine, uh, is this patient uh, basically displaying capacity and able to cooperate with others? Um, these patients are situated in a group setting and usually have roommates when they're staying at this facility. And so they cannot display excessive violent behavior um, requiring sedation or physical restraints. Um, also, this, this facility is not equipped to closely monitor vital signs. And so they cannot have any patients that have had intentional overdoses that re would require evaluation in the emergency department. Um, there is a caveat to that that we'll go over uh, shortly. And then um, these patients have to be able to function independently as they do not have uh, caregivers like you would see at a nursing facility. Um, and so they have to be able to perform their activities of daily living without assistance. Uh, if a patient requires a cane um, for ambulation, but they otherwise can function independently, then they would possibly still meet criteria um, for transport to these alternative destinations. So next in this protocol, um, you can see that patients uh, who elect to, to be transported um, to alternative destination and do not want to go to the emergency department and meet the inclusion criteria, um, even if they are under an involuntary commitment, uh, may be transported to the recovery response center. So um, this includes patients who are su suicidal or homicidal uh, without any intent. Um, patients who are requesting detox, um, and this includes prescription and illicit substances uh, such as benzodiazepines, cocaine, methamphetamine, or opioids, uh, and alcohol. Um, any patient with a new onset of mental health issues, um, but that is able to meet medical decision-making capacity and is not displaying signs of an acute psychosis, um, which is suggested by audible or visual hallucinations, um, excessive paranoia or suspiciousness, suspiciousness, or odd beliefs or magical thinking. And any patient that has an exacerbation of their mental health issue. Now, if a patient has a history of auditory hallucinations when they have excessive uh, anxiety, and this is a, a constant symptoms that has occurred in the past, they still may meet criteria for transport to this alternative destination, even um, as long as they meet medical decision-making capacity. So the required assessments are a thorough history and physical exam. Um, keep in mind, we are not transporting these patients to the emergency department. And so it is our, our role um, to make sure that they do not have any medical or traumatic conditions that would require further evaluation in the emergency department. Um, this includes assessment of vital signs. Um, these patients have to be offered this alternative destination and have to have medical decision making capacity in order to elect to go to the recovery response center. Um, we have to be very careful in screening for any suicide attempts, and this can be as subtle as excessive ingestions of Tylenol, uh, which is one of the most common toxicologic uh, substances ingested in the United States. And, and then patients should receive an AccuCheck to screen for any uh, asymptomatic hypo or excessive hyperglycemia. So the exclusion criteria are um, numerous, but that's uh, that's great in order to keep these patients safe. So any patients with altered mental status and a desire to go to the emergency department or patients that cannot perform their ADLs uh, should go to the emergency department. Um, this facility is not equipped to take pediatric patients at this time because this is a primarily adult setting. And so any patient uh, under the age of 18 will require transport to the emergency department. Um, any patient with unstable vital signs or a blood glucose of less than 60 or greater than 400. Um, any patients with seizures in the past 72 hours. Um, patients who need fr frequent monitoring for a medical device. Um, keep in mind that patients who have an AICD or a pacemaker um, may still be eligible for transport to the alternative destination as these, these patients are very asymptomatic and not having any cardiac complaints. Um, do not require frequent monitoring. Any patient in third trimester pregnancy defined by greater than 28 weeks gestation. Um, any patient who has had an intentional overdose uh, with, with a caveat to that that we'll discuss shortly. Um, and any patients um, with acute agitation, bar six or seven, or signs of a new or acute psychosis. So a couple cases. <clears throat> um, a 52-year-old male patient with a history of depression and suicidal thoughts with a plan to run into traffic. 
The patient is located at his apartment and was placed under an IVC by police officers. There were no suicide or homicide attempts, no other symptoms. Vital signs are a pulse of 88, respiratory rate of 18, temp of 98.8, blood pressure of 124 over 72, and oxygen saturation of 98% on room air. Um, this patient, even though they're under an IVC, they have not attempted suicide, and so they would be eligible for transport to the recovery response center. Case number two, a call to the 47-year-old female with a history of depression and hypertension found at home at 915 requesting detox. The patient had an overdose at 23.30 last night that responded to a single dose of intranasal 2 milligrams Narcan administered by EMS, returned to baseline, but refused transport. Patient is now requesting to be transported for detox. This was the caveat that I was alluding to earlier. And uh, so we have been uh, told that patients who um, have had a single um, a simple opioid overdose that responded uh, to a single dose of Narcan and did not require a repeat or uh, dosing and do not require for the monitor and are low risk for repeat overdose are still eligible for transport to the recovery response center. And so this patient um, who has been stable overnight and did not re, um, require any additional Narcan would be eligible. Case number three, a 24 year old female, approximately 31 weeks gestation calls EMS due to feeling anxious. The patient had no past medical history and recently separated from her husband. She denies any attempts or thoughts of suicide. Vital signs are a pulse of 74, respiratory rate of 18, temp of 99, blood pressure of 118 over 68, and oxygen saturation 99% under mer. Now, this patient is stable otherwise and has not had any attempts. However, she is greater than 28 weeks to station and would require transport to the emergency department or labor and delivery. Case number four, a 59 year old male at a nursing facility who requested EMS due to suicidal thoughts. The patient denies any attempts, past medical history of diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and currently being treated for osteomyelitis by IV antibiotics. He is otherwise able to ambulate and performs ADLs independently. Now, this patient is able to perform their ADLs independently um, and is otherwise medically stable with no suicidal attempts. However, he is receiving IV antibiotics for osteomyelitis, which typically ranges between four to eight weeks of therapy. And most of these patients have pick lines and midlines. So they would be ineligible for transport to the recovery response center because they need monitoring of their um, pick line or midline. Um, and they would need require transport to the emergency department. So again, these are some available resources that we have in Orange County. Uh, up top, we have the Recovery Response Center uh, with the phone number and the address. Uh, of course, we have our poison control number, um, which is tied to our local area code. Um, and then we still have access to the Chapel Hill and Freedom House mobile crisis teams. Um, these are great resources, especially for patients that do not uh, want transport to any facility and refuse transport. Um, these, pa these teams can go out and, and uh, provide these patients with additional resources. So in regards to the logistics of transport, all these patients have to be transported to ALS. Uh, and the reason for that is that we have to be prepared for a change in bar status. Uh, and a patient with a BARS-5 could easily uh, escalate to a BARS-6 or 7. We have to be prepared for verbal de-escalation early, um, be prepared to uh, physically and chemically restrain patients if they become excessively agitated, um, and definitely discuss and um, um, these decisions prior to transport and prepare for these decisions prior to transport. Um, any patient who requires chemical or physical restraints, even in transport to the recovery response center, would, would be excluded from these protocols and would require transport to the emergency department in that situation. So in summary, uh, remember to evaluate for life-threatening medical or traumatic conditions, which is our primary priority. Um, as pre-hospital providers. Um, patients should be offered alternative destinations if they meet inclusion criteria, um, but if they want to go to the emergency department, it is still within their right to be evaluated at the emergency department. Um, we should screen for the inclusion and exclusion criteria on all of these patients because they can be subtle, especially when we are um, first rolling out this protocol. 
um, utilize the resources such as the Recovery Response Center and mobile crisis teams, especially for patients that refuse transport to any location. Um, and then make sure that any patient uh, with behavioral health emergencies are transported via, via ALS and uh, be prepared for changes in bar status requiring chemical or physical restraints. Thank you for your time.